across the country. Okay, I'm not sure what that was about. But uh, over the past few weeks, we've learned that libraries across the country, not just in Massachusetts and not just locally, school libraries have been closing down. Uh, it's a struggle in this day and age, and things are changing as the internet changes the way we communicate. So there are all kinds of different issues uh, on the table, and uh, we have people coming at this from, from different perspectives. So I thought I would start with by putting out a question to all five of you. What, what's going on with school libraries these days? Is it is it a crisis? Is it an evolution? What's, what's going on? Why don't we start with you, um, uh, Deborah? Thank you. Well, there's good news in pockets of the state that school library programs are growing. So it's not that they're all closing down. Um, Boston Public Schools, where I was the former director of library services, is, by 2025 will have school libraries, equitable school access, um, student access to school libraries in every school. Um, Springfield is adding libraries. And so there are definitely some strong urban and rural models um, being implemented. Don't, don't um, media rooms and, and, and technology rooms serve some of the um, role that libraries used to, to serve or maybe still do? Deborah? Uh, I, I, I'll just say that um, a school library is a representation of knowledge for a child and children don't know what they don't know. So if they're, if they're um, looking at the shelves and they come along and serendipitously find something that's really of interest to them, they'll pull it off the shelf where on the internet, they don't have the terminology or the background knowledge to do research to find what they really are interested in. So media rooms and, and technology rooms build the skills to, to be able to type and, and search, but not the, not the um, cognitive and academic content skills, unless they're they have, um, you know, strong teachers, which hopefully they do. Uh, Madeline, uh, in New Bedford, you serve kind of dual roles. You are, uh, and I think Laura does the same in Dartmouth. Uh, you are a librarian, but you are also uh, involved in instruction in some media things. Uh, tell me about your role. How, how, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say you are the first librarian in New Bedford uh, uh, as, the, as the system has brought back a librarian for the first time. And I'm not sure how long, Andrew, you might be able to tell me that. Well, well Madeline, t tell me about your job and, and, and the multiple hats that you wear. So um, I'm the library media specialist at New Bedford. Where I started. Um, I believe she was here for about four years before I started here. And um, part of my role is engaging students with independent reading, but also, as you said, I teach classes um, related to research, um, media, like learning how to use um, online platforms like Canva and Google Slides and those kinds of things. I also teach information literacy classes, and I collaborate with teachers across all of our content areas like ESL and special ed, and um, we collaborate on all different kinds of lessons. Okay. So wh why um, is it important that you do, that you play both roles here? Um, so we are a one-to-one -one school, so every student has a laptop, um, and that's like the primary way that they're engaging in schoolwork most times. So they're creating um, PowerPoints and all sorts of online projects um, for their classes. And it's great um, when we're introducing like a new um, platform for, for students to have explicit instruction on how to use different online tools that um, they might not always be getting in their core content classes that are focusing on like teaching math and teaching English language language arts so I can really be um, a person in the school that's supporting teachers with um, teaching media literacy and um, research and as well as like computer skills and how to use these um, digital platforms. Laura, Laura Gardner, you also uh, wear multiple hats and 
<laughs> in Dartmouth, um, you're a teacher and a librarian. Tell, tell me about how, how you combine the jobs. So my job is super fun and the library is super fun. It really is the heart of the school. And that was what my principal asked me to do when I was hired here 15 years ago. He wanted it to be a fun, lively place where kids wanted to go, where they were excited to go and get a book or do a craft project. We have a makerspace in the library, so it's not just about books and research. It's also about kids exploring. And um, sometimes it's just about them sitting and doing a craft together and chatting with their friends, which is we know is super important after COVID for kids to get back to those social skills. Um, I really love the recommendation part of my job. The one-to-one -one book matching is my number one favorite thing. Um, I collaborate with ELA teachers all the time to help do book buffets and book talks. We started doing a lot of book clubs where I purchase multiple copies of the same book and then we get kids to check out the same book as their friends so that then they can have an informal book club just the way we adults like to have book clubs. A success with that. And it's been um, a really fun way to encourage independent reading at a time when reading skills are really plummeting and distractions are more than ever before. I mean, it's harder to get a kid to pick up a book. It's harder to get a kid to keep reading. I have had to purchase, um, you know, texts that are at a lower level in the last few years to support students who are behind in reading because we know that the gaps are bigger than ever before. So my job, that's, that's a big part of my job. But as you said, instruction is also a huge part of my job. Just today, I was teaching a class with sixth grade class, sixth grade students um, about how to cite sources using Noodle Tools, which is our district platform for citation. Um, I'm doing a lesson next week with eighth grade classes on information evaluation, which I have to revise every single year because it just changes so much. 15 years ago, I would teach a um, checklist on how to check if a website was great, great or not. And now it's it's about, is this triggering you emotionally? How do we talk about AI, social media? You know, it's all of, there's so much more to it. It's so much more complicated and nuanced. Um, and that information literacy component is what we librarians do best. And um, it's kind of our, our, our bread and butter along with teaching the research projects. So like guided inquiry design is what I use for my research projects. And I do several of those a year with different um, grade levels. It's very in-depth kids get to pick their topic, their question, and then they get to explore what is the answer. Um, and it's it's really fun. It's really fun to do all these kinds of things. I really think of myself as like the purveyor of fun in the building. And, um, you know, it's what education is all about. It's about personalized learning. It's about um, helping kids find the sources, the resources that they personally um, are excited to explore because of their own interests. So, that's that's a little that's a little bit about what the job's like, but it's different every day, which is the best part. <laughs> Ma Madeline, um, we all read about how kids are getting most of their information on TikTok and and um, the popularity of graphic novels. I mean, graphic, you know, uh, comics, and um, uh, we just wonder: uh, uh, is literacy going to play the same role it once did, or are we moving to a world where um, you know, the traditional uh, researching and um, reading long form uh, works, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, is going to be as important or, you know, it's, it just seems like everything I, I see online nowadays has a, a video component. And maybe that's just the way people are going to be communicating. Madeline? Um, so that's a really interesting question. And I feel like it comes up all the time. There's like this fear that kids just aren't reading as much. And part of that is true because there are so uh, many distractions and not just for kids too, for adults as well, we use a lot of social media and we've kind of um, accepted this um, so almost uncritically um, just so we can't just blame kids for being distracted, right? And um, part of that has led to like an increase in wanting to read like manga and more like graphic novels and visual texts. I don't think it's the case that kids aren't reading as much because when presented with independent reading choice of 
um, books that they want to read and are interested in, they do engage in reading. Um, and there is, you know, research on like what digital age, digital native youth prefer to read. And it is a little bit different than previous generations just because they grew up with the internet. And usually um, this um, means like alternative forms of text, like maybe novels in verse or poetry, or like you said, the graphic novels and manga. I don't see that as a bad thing personally. I just think maybe literacy is evolving and this generation prefers particular genres, particular formats. To me, um, those are still reading and there's really like high quality um, works of literature within those formats. Uh, Dr. Sabre McGuire, is, um, Dartmouth has managed to keep um, libraries and librarians at both the high school and um, the middle school level. If I'm understanding correctly, they, they don't have them at the, the all the grade schools anymore. What is um, the thinking in Dartmouth about libraries and um, their role vis-a-vis -vis media centers and everything else? So being fairly new to Dartmouth, although I'm coming up on completing a full year, I'm really excited about that. I have to say, excited about when I was interviewing in Dartmouth was that there were libraries and that there were librarians in the library, certified librarians. And so that to me was really important. And my prior district, we had seen that, um, you know, that was something that was in fact going by the wayside. And those were positions that during budget crunches were sometimes the first positions that were being eliminated. Uh, so coming to Dartmouth, I was excited to see that they had uh, certified librarians, teachers in uh, the middle and high school. At the elementary schools, they do have, there are libraries in each of the elementary schools, and there is staff uh, in each of those libraries. Uh, so they're a full-time staff. They are what we call in Dartmouth education support professionals. Um, so, I mean, these are people who do really good work as well. Uh, so I don't want in any way want to disparage the work that happens there because I know that I've been in those libraries and I know they're an important part of, of each one of those elementary schools. And certainly I've been in the middle school library. I love going in there. I have to say like Laura does an amazing job um, just displaying reading re the resources that kids may or are probably asking her and she's she is getting to know her students and in response to getting to know them I can see that she puts out books that are you know themed and making sure that there are multiple themes so it's not as if it's only one uh, particular area of interest that a group of students may have but it's really about access uh, so I think that that's particularly important, especially at the middle school level where you really do want to create a love of reading. Um, you want, I mean, as a, a go, again, going back a long way as an elementary student, I have to tell you, my favorite specialist was library. I couldn't wait every week to get into the library and pick out, you know, whatever book it was. And, you know, um, Beverly Cleary and Judy Bloom and all those books that I grew up on. Um, so I know that there are kids out there that have that same love and look forward to that time. Again, that was at the elementary level, middle school level, high school level. Um, so I do think there's a commitment to maintaining school libraries in Dartmouth. Um, we're not immune to the budget cut, right, I issue that's going, or the budget challenge, I should say, that's going across, going on across the state. Um, I'm happy to say that, you know, that right now, it seems to me that there is a commitment to maintaining school libraries in the Dartmouth schools. Uh, this could be a question for either you or Laura. Who, who does the purchasing of new books for the elementary school, since there is no librarian per se? I mean, that, that takes some skill and knowledge of what uh, what kind of materials kids are interested in and are reading. So who currently does? I mean, I, I, I know that some schools, because of budgets, have not been able to purchase new editions. Are you still purchasing in, in Dartmouth? We are still purchasing. I know that there is a line item in our budget for purchasing books for the library. Um, I'm not really sure who's purchasing the books for the elementary level. So that would be something that I would have to 
to investigate. Maybe Laura knows. So I, I apologize for putting you on the spot. Uh, the, the, the no, question. no, that's okay. It's not on the spot. The, the, you know, I'm still in my first year, so I'm very comfortable saying I'm not really sure about that right now. <laughs> yeah. um, but one thing that I do know, um, you know, sadly, we did have a certified librarian in one of our libraries at the elementary level uh, this past year. And I know that that was a position that uh, we didn't fill this for this coming school year. So it was probably that person. Okay. Mr. O'Leary, I wonder if I can go to you. Um, I, I know that there are uh, special challenges with libraries and everything else in urban school systems. New Bedford recently spent $50,000 um, uh, rehabbing um, the uh, library, uh, fixing uh, skylight uh, and uh, 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 adding retractable monitors that raise up out of the tables. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, the uh, challenges of, of, of libraries in an urban school system. Yeah, certainly. Although um, I'm enjoying uh, listening to Ms. Gardner and Ms. Freitas Pimento um, about the school, our libraries being the heart of the school. So it's a wonderful way to describe it. But as you know, my background is in the bureaucracy and, and the systems over the last uh, decade or more. And to your question, I mean, the Student Opportunity Act that brought additional funding to uh, cities like New Bedford, uh, Brockton, Springfield, et cetera, and made the funding formula more equitable. In large part, that's a recognition of what was not there before. In large part, that's a recognition that cities like New Bedford were chronically underfunded by the state. And that occurred at the same time as a, a strong accountability regimen where there was um, essentially, it, it was incentivized to drill down on core content and to treat other things budgetarily and in terms of operation, treat other things as um, ancillary, ma ancillary matters. I think that's what led to, in large part, the inability uh, to fund or sustain libraries. I think if you, one example will be at the middle schools in New Bedford, which when they were constructed in um, wonderful buildings and spaces in around 2003, I think when they were constructed, they would have been fully stocked. For example, their collections would have been fully stocked as part of that MSBA or SBA process. And then over time, there's no ability to sustain that. So I think that chronic underfunding um, is largely to blame for that, as well as the inability of districts to, to meaning, meaningfully plan uh, how to integrate school library and school library into the life of the school. Now that's the past. I think optimistically looking forward where Student Opportunity Act is now, now it's off and running and you do see um, a much more stable forward-looking environment, we hope, in, in the budget in, in New Bedford, where we're able to look forward and invest. I know that um, New Bedford has um, a large uh, um, English uh, as a second language population in, in, in throughout its, its school systems, and that you've explained to me your belief that the immigrant population is a strength, not, not, not a burden, but it does um, present some unique issues. Are there, are there issues relative to resources going to literacy specialists versus librarians? Uh, do they overlap? Um, well, how does New Bedford, you know, sort of balance out those 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 needs? Yeah, I think there's a broader conversation about literacy, and, and that's ultimately the mission of, of a school system more broadly, is to develop engaged readers, um, to develop students who are literate and um, to the highest possible standard. And so we um, again, like uh, Dr. Saylor McGuire, I'm in the, the job a year, so looking at what our plans are, I think a coherent literacy plan is something we're very interested in. Fortunately, we have those assets out in the district. We are, I think we are a leader um, in the state in terms of our approach to multilingual learners and a key part of how, um, how teaching and learning looks for multilingual learners is looking at their um, linguistic and ethnic background as a strength and um, how that would translate into a literacy plan is ensuring that um, all of their, their background is integrated into how um, they receive uh, English instruction and also how they access resources. And I'm sure um, our librarians could speak to that. I know that that's a feature of our library at New Bedford High as well. Uh, Deborah, I, I wonder if, if I go back to the, the shortage of life. I think it's safe to say that most of us are in favor of libraries and school libraries and and know that they are important. But the fact remains that um, um, even Dartmouth, which is, is is perhaps the most affluent of the three greater New Bedford communities, doesn't have them at the grade school level now 
Fairhaven, which, uh, by the way, I invited um, Superintendent Tara Kohler from the Fairhaven School System to join us, uh, did not hear back from her. I, my understanding is that they don't have any librarians in Fairhaven right now. Uh, they do have staff members uh, running the libraries, which are still up and running. And New Bedford um, uh, uh, has brought back a librarian, uh, but certainly would be happy to have more, I'm sure, if, if, if they could. Uh, uh, but the fact remains is that that across the board, we have less librarians than we used to. What What's going on here and, 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 and what is the crisis? Well, I could say a, a few things. Um, over the course of my career and in the six school districts where I worked, it, I feel as though the training for administrators often does not include how significant school library access is to students. And the strong body of research is called the School Library Impact Studies that have been taking place since 1980. And so, you know, when we think of budget cuts, often the libraries are the first to be cut because there's this miss or just lack of understanding it, it to nobody's fault. Um, and then there are hard decisions to make. Um, I, you know, I had a, a really close relationship with a principal in Boston Public Schools, but he had to choose between social workers and librarians, you know, and those, you know, and how to, you know, there's not enough funding for either. And so those are really hard decisions to make that are put in front of administrators. Um, I also, there, there are um, districts that are at probably equally at the same level of, of um, background as Dartmouth and New Bedford and, and, and so on. And they do have librarians and they have figured out how to, to um, pay for them and use their, their expertise that you've just heard Laura and Madeline describe to benefit every student in the school. And so there are models out there. Um, there's models where if you have five elementary schools, you can have a certified library media specialist. I did that in Danvers. And you, you, you travel through the five schools and you work with all the grade levels to implement guided inquiry design at each of the grade levels. And, and it's possible. So it's a lot of work, but it's possible. And, and so there are models out there to, to sustain and grow. Um, student access to this resource. Um, you know, as both Madeline and Laura alluded, you know, libraries build independent learning and, and build citizenship. And um, so we, you know, we, we really need to begin to think of, and we are thinking about that, this at the legislative level. I can talk more about that at another point if you wish, but wouldn't it be great if it was part uh, like having gym and nurses that every, school has, or every student has access to a librarian and an yeah. I, I want to mention that I was shocked in, in um, my preparation for this um, uh, forum uh, to discover that um, there is a, a, a national a Massachusetts Association of Schools and Colleges that plays a role in accreditation that eliminated the library requirement a while ago. I, I, I was surprised at that, and I don't know what the thinking was. Um, maybe someone on the panel, anyone can speak to that. And the other question that I'm interested in is um, uh, some speci specifics about the research that shows that libraries are connected to um, literacy and whether that research is across demographics. In other words, it, it holds true for ESL students and um, low income students. Anybody can, can, can jump in here. All right, I'll pick someone, Laura. <laughs> Laura knows, I know she does. Always a dangerous thing to say anybody can jump in on these things. So um, the studies that Deb was referencing, which have been ongoing for a really long time, have proven that, yes, libraries benefit all students across all demographics um, and lead to academic success, um, especially when it comes to reading levels and literacy, but in other areas as well. 
Um, and you know, the, the truth is like, we support all learners. We have, um, books on hand and our expertise is making that match and helping every single reader find the next right book for them. So that's why, you know, with my reading specialist, I work very carefully to make sure that um, we have texts that are going to fit our lower level readers so that they can grow and improve in their reading scores. Um, and a lot of those students will start with graphic novels or manga, and then they'll move to novels and verse, which are have just exploded. I heard Madeline mention those. They're just wildly popular um, and very accessible because they have fewer words on the page, a lot more white space. Um, and, and then from there, go on. We also have digital resources that are very helpful. Um, a lot of schools in Massachusetts use Sora um, along with the Commonwealth eBook collection that's supported by the Massachusetts Library System. And Sora has support for other languages. Um, and it also works well with Google Translate. Um, I also have, you know, a part of my collection is books in Spanish and English and, uh, sorry, Spanish and French and Portuguese. Um, so I have those resources for students who come in speaking a different language to support them. Just two days ago, I had a student who said, you know, I'm not liking this book. Um, and she's a student who was born in El Salvador. And I said, well, would you like to read a book in Spanish? And she got really excited and she said, you know, my mom is worried about me losing my Spanish. So she'll be really happy that I bring home a book in Spanish. Um, and, you know, as Andrew said, it's just so important to, um, you know, validate that culture and that home language. Um, and that is one of the ways that students improve in their reading. And we're tra trained to do that as librarians. Madeline, I was I was taken in, in reading uh, the story about you. Uh, there was a young woman, and I forget what the subject was that 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 you identified that she was interested in, and she kept getting coming back and getting um, more books on the same subject. Uh, Andrew has told me about the the graphic comics flying off the shelf in your Bedford. How how do you get to know what students want and what will work for the different students? Um, so part of that is um, building relationships with students, and um, we're lucky to be part of the sales library network as well. So if there's a book that students are looking for and I don't have them on my shelves, I can um, enter a library, loan them from another public library or college library in the state. And depending on what they're request is, um, I'll look into buying, then purchasing it for this library if you don't already own it. So um, that's one way. And then of course there's um, publications like School Library Journal and those kinds of things that help um, librarians make decisions about collection development. And those are great because I often come across books that way um, that I may not have um, otherwise. And then I can introduce them to students and students then learn about new titles that way as well. Um, but the manga and the comics have been um, extremely popular. So um, I also like collect student opinion through um, forums and surveys. And I'm always taking suggestions from students of what to order. Um, yesterday, actually, one messaged me and asked if I was still taking book suggestions, and she had given me a long list, and it was actually all um, classics that she wanted to make sure were in the school library, um, because she's going through, um, an ambitious reader going through a phase of reading all of the classics. Um, but the other piece to that, too, is also working with teachers and making sure that I have books in the collection to support their major projects and units um, and their curriculum as well. So collection development is um, a huge um, project and part of my job that takes a lot of um, my time and thought, as I'm sure um, Laura knows as well. Um, I wonder if I can ask, um, and I don't even know if this falls in your purview, but it seems like it should. We all hear about how kids are just living on social media nowadays, whether it's TikTok or Instagram and Snapchat. And, um, you know, they find various things on there and, and they're reading, you know, uh, it, the librarians have any role in, in talking to kids about social media and, and 
knowledge of what they're seeing and how to guide them on that, uh, either Madeline or Laura? I'm happy to speak to that. So um, we have a digital literacy teacher in our school. I used to teach this exclusively to sixth graders, digital, but since then the district has hired um, a digital literacy teacher who teaches sixth, seventh, and eighth. But I also address this. Um, every year I do a survey with eighth graders about their um, social media use and um, habits. And then we just have a frank conversation about the research that's out there um, and the impact of social media use and um, device use, like you know, the nine hours average a day that the you know average teenager spends. Um, about how it impacts anxiety and focus and body image issues and just all the things. Um, and then I do a post survey to find out, you know, does this impact you? Do you want to change your habits? And I give them tips and tricks for how to do so. Um, and it's been very well received and successful. Um, I do that with the eighth grade classes. Um, but this gets back to the information evaluation because the truth is a lot of people, not just children, a lot of adults as well, get a lot of their information from social media. And um, as I said before, a huge part of our job is teaching information evaluation and talking about misinformation and talking about the importance of um, evaluating sources and reading laterally, you know, like checking with other sources um, and all of these sorts of things. So this is something that I'm talking about all the time. You know, we shouldn't be only getting our news from TikTok and Snapchat. Um, that is not necessarily a trusted news site you know like some news organizations are getting on TikTok and Snapchat and some people think they should um and you know we we have discussions about what all of this means and um you know the the different kind of debates that are out there like there's a great new book that I'm going to pick up today called The Anxious Generation by Jonathan Haidt that just came out last week um and he's arguing that you know teenagers shouldn't have smartphones before the age of uh, before high school, and they shouldn't have social media before 16. And he thinks this should be codified in national law. Like, this is a big debate that's going on. And um, it's an interesting one that I know our students have opinions about. So um, we talk about it for sure. That that issue of, of good sources of information and unreliable sources of information, I think is an important one. When I, when I was in high school, a 1000 years ago, they were talking about the importance of footnotes, and having credible sources for your information and librarians guided me as to how to use the card catalog and how to um, look look for credible sources of information to back up uh, what my writing. Um, does that still go on, Madeline, for librarians? Are you still showing people how to do research? Madeline? Um, yeah, that's definitely still going on. Um... We have the online catalog that I show students how to use as far as um, requesting sources and resources through interlibrary loan. Um, but then there's the databases um, that students use for research as well. Um, and research lessons are requested by teachers like across all content areas from ELA to social studies to world languages. So it's still like definitely a really um, big part of the role of a school librarian. And it's also definitely still a need in schools for sure. Um, that hasn't gone away. Um, in fact, there's more of a need for it, right? Because there's more information available. Uh, I would be remiss if I, I did not bring up the, the subject of budgets. Uh, uh, you know, we, we don't live in a world of unlimited resources. Um, particularly school administrators have to make hard decisions um, uh, on on what they will prioritize and what they uh, unfortunately can't prioritize. Uh, Dr. Sabre McGuire, uh, how is there a philosophy that guides you, um, uh, you know, in making those decisions? Because it does seem that that in recent years, libraries have been a um, a prime area for people to look at when when cuts have to be made. I don't know whether in a previous system. I know you're new to Dartmouth, but whether in a previous I'm new to I'm new to Dartmouth, and of course we're having lots of budget discussions here in Dartmouth. We're facing budget a budget challenge. As a matter of fact, this year if we didn't have uh, uh, school savings through school choice, we would have had to make a number of uh, pretty significant cuts to staffing. And even with that, we've had to make some really hard decisions about positions in the school district. And so in 
again, I, I talk about the prior district I was in um, for 29 years, um, librarians, and, and I'm not saying that I, I wasn't at the table <laughs> when these decisions were being made, but I was certainly in a school as a principal, and um, we definitely uh, eliminated librarians across the school district and only ended up keeping one in a really large district um, at the high school level. So at the same time here in Dartmouth that I recognize that, you know, we have a challenging budget here and it's our job right now to educate the public because we can't afford to lose any of the positions that we have in our school district. And as we go through what we're currently involved with, which is strategic planning, um, we have to think, I think, strategically about not only what we have that we want to preserve, but what we don't have that should be part of our strategic planning moving forward. And of course, that has budget implications. And so in my mind as superintendent right now, it's my job to tell the community what I think they need um, in order to have uh, strong, uh, healthy school, a uh, strong, healthy school district where, you know, teachers, educators, regardless of your position here, um, that you understand that you're valued and you're important and that the kids here are getting what they need. So as superintendent, that's the job. Um, I understand that if those decisions have to be made, they're, they're not just on the superintendent, but it's really a team approach. But I do take the stance that, I'm speaking for the Dartmouth community now, having been here for almost a year, that we can't afford to lose positions. And in fact, we need to be looking at where we need to um, strengthen certain areas. In that prior community where they cut librarians across the board, was that a administrator recommendation or a school committee guidance? To, to it was a. It was related to a sixteen million dollar budget deficit, and that was pre. And Andrew will appreciate this. This was pre passage of the Student Opportunity Act, so it was a pretty painful time in the school district where. Um, you know, some significant cuts had to happen, and and that was just an area that they I wouldn't say it was one person. I'm sure that there was a, a team of people who had to make those really difficult decisions. Andrew, uh, uh, you, you talked about the Student Opportunity Act, and things are a little better in the wake of it, but but still, things are not perfect. Um, when um, cuts in in priorities have to be established. Is that a um, an educator's recommendation, school committee guidance, combination? How, how do you see that? Yeah, I think, so ultimately the budget is recommended by the administration, the superintendent to the school committee, and then ideally there would be a lot of um, a lot of healthy discussion around that. And then there are, be it the, um, uh, the teachers union or the community at large, depending on how engaged they are in the process, they can do all that. So there's the ideal, but there's also the reality. And the reality is when these shocks happen, it's, it can be something of a slash and burn and a cut, and you're laying off categories of people. And then at the same time, you have, you have mandates around our services where, where a baseline level of service or provision has to be met. And then at the same time, you have um, union or other contracts where folks have to bid, and you have to respect all of those things in the context. So I think when we're really getting into the reality a budget. The reality of budget does mean that this that that's that reality where, and you see it right now in Massachusetts, where um, libraries and school libraries end up closing or school libraries end up under resourced. I think what you're seeing right now is some of the Student Opportunity Act communities that are benefiting New Bedford and others are restoring things. However, enrollment-wise, be it the housing crisis or whatever, or just enrollment and demographics in Massachusetts, you have communities where they're having that enrollment budget shock. So all of a sudden your enrollment dips two or 300, 400 kids over two years, and you're not getting the revenue or there's not a willingness to invest at the same level that you would have had before, or there's not a vision for what's forward looking. That's exactly what you're seeing in those commuter towns around the state. And um, their inability to, and it almost ties into the housing crisis, their inability to commit to future housing, future families. Um, it's actually a very negative and pessimistic view how you should build out. You know, I, I approach all of this as in an optimistic view. We are always building for the future. We are always building. Our budget next year will be $251 million. You can't say that that's not 
that that's too little. Um, it might not reach everything, but it's a significant investment. So how are we investing in what students need? How are we integrating multilingual learners? How are we committing uh, to literacy? There's multiple ways to do that, and, and certainly libraries are a part of that. Um, I know that both Madeline and Laura have are wearing multiple hats and and involved in technology and and and, and uh, instruction and uh, traditional librarian skills. Um, is there any sense that as um, hard decisions and cuts have to be make made that uh, departments can be combined so that this doesn't seem to be all librarians as opposed to uh, technology people or, or media people? I'll put you on the spot, Andrew. For that. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible. One thing, you know, what's, what's come out now, and I, I hope that we're getting better at budgeting in Massachusetts. I hope there's more stability. One thing that I was looking at during the week was the per pupil reports of spending that come out in um, Massachusetts. And Massachusetts does a good job. It's called the Unif if you guys can stay with me now, I'm going to get bureaucratic, but the unified Massachusetts accounting system that does actually break down what districts spend on. And I actually pulled it up um, last night and, you know, New Bedford, it really per pupil, it really does not spend a lot in relative terms on um, libraries, materials, and librarians. But that's historic. It's incrementally increased. I think it could do to go up a little more. But then you look at communities like Newton or Wellesley, and they spend multiple, maybe five or 10 times annually. And annual is important because it compounds, right? It's um, If you're doing it every year, that's wonderful. So the annually, they're spending five, 10 times what New Bedford's spending. I'm not saying that anything more than just an analysis of what's been going on um, the past few years, but there is that ability to look and break down what we're spending. What we have spent more on in New Bedford, we spent more on student and staff technology. Every student gets a laptop all the time over the past few years. And that started on federal funding and now the federal funding went away, it migrated to local funding. So we maintain that. And that is very important. We Students are corresponding with their teachers and learning, completing assignments and so forth. They have to have that one-to-one. -one. It's not gonna be purchased at home as a mandate we're going to provide it. So that technology has increased. Now that would have been in the library media center, perhaps in the past. So there is that shift, but that is a significant expense and outlay for the districts as well. So all of this is just a balance um, every budget year, but I hope we're getting better at analyzing those expenditures and, and forward looking. Uh, Deborah Laura had led, led me to a study um, about principals and um, librarians and uh, how a principal or I guess even a superintendent, you know, knowledge and personal experience with li libraries and librarians is a big factor in how they value it. Um, I, I, I just have a sense and not present company excluded, but, but the, the, that, that some um, uh, administrators may not have a good grasp on everything that librarians do or can do if they are good librarians and like anything else, I'm sure there are good librarians and better librarians. Is there a lack of knowledge of what librarians do? Well, as I alluded to before, I, you know, it, it when you go to principal school, like to get your certification and become greater, often the assignment is, okay, here's your budget. What are you going to cut? You know, it's not how libraries benefit the students and the research behind it. You know, the principals don't learn that there's research about access to a good school library and a librarian and dropout rates and, you know, improving that. You know, there's, so the, it, it would be great if Boston College and Simmons, well, Simmons isn't much of an ed school anymore, but they did. But the schools that are training administrators that would include this research and we as a, as an organization are, are striving to, to educate um, the administrative organizations about the impact that, that school librarians have. Um, I, I wanna just go back to, you know, knowing your students well, both Laura and Madeline referenced, how do, you, how do you know what books to choose and so on. A good school librarian knows every student in the school. And um, you, most school librarians know what kids are experiencing at a given time and, um, a good school librarian is really integrated across the school community 
knows what student is studying what at any given time. So when a student comes in and is, is in Mr. Jones's class, the librarian will know what that, that ch child needs because they have the capability of, um, of intersecting with that particular team of teachers or, or what have you. So, but um, I, I, my, in my, you know, I'm a seasoned person, if you will, um, the principals that didn't get it weren't exposed to libraries, it seemed, or didn't use them themselves. And so, you know, it becomes very subjective in that fashion. So I, the column I wrote a few weeks ago, um, I wrote about the library, the high school library at, at St. John's Prep, where, where I went to high school, um, being a refuge for me, a, a place uh, where I discovered all kinds of things that that I would not have known about before and 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 how helpful librarians were. What, what I didn't say per se in that column was that I really spent a lot of time wasting time in, in that library um, at St. John's because I was reading things that had nothing to do with my coursework, nothing to do with my, um, uh, uh, and maybe that that's why I'm a journalist today and not a lawyer as my mother would have liked, but, but uh, I, is there a role for libraries as just a place of creativity where kids can just be doing things that are not on point, on on message for like, you know, MCAS wants this, sports wants that, whatever else, you know, preparation for college wants this. Um, is there a role for libraries in just being a place to, to um, hang out? I would love to take this. So yeah, <laughs> there's research on libraries. It's a really important third space. Um, all of us who are educators know that every kid needs to have a place in the school or a teacher in the building who's like their person that they trust. And for some students, it's the library and it's the librarian. And it's because they can go there and just color or do a craft or look for a book with a friend or talk about the books that they've read with a friend, which I see frequently. Um, I have lunch bunch in the library. It used to be that I'd read aloud to my lunch bunch kids before COVID. And then after COVID, the guidance counselors and I decided that what they needed most of all was just to be able to sit and chat with their friends. Um, and so I have around 35 kids in seventh grade and eighth grade who eat their lunch in the library almost every day, unless I'm collaborating with the class during that period. And they're playing Exploding Kittens and Uno and Jenga, and they're chatting. And it's wonderful. And sometimes they're checking out books and sometimes the public librarian comes in. But yes, I don't think that it's ever wasted time. I think it's important time. I think it's, you know, those interstitial times and that time spent just being and existing in a place where you feel completely safe and you know that you belong all the time. Um, I think that's really important to have that in a school and, and a place where you feel like there's something for everyone, whether it's the diverse books on the shelf where you can see yourself in the books or see someone else, or whether it's all the different options with the makerspace, or whether it's just having a quiet place to sit on a cushy um, bean bag and just read and and be. So, yes. Now, Madeline, what about the kids that you encounter at, at the New Bedford High Library? Do you, do you encounter kids that um just looking for something else, just looking for uh, something else to do rather than schoolwork? <laughs> um, yeah, I have to second everything that Laura said, and I kind of have um, my own lunch bunch during the lunch periods, even though I haven't um, called them that. Um, but same as Laura, I have students who spend their lunch period here almost every day um, if I'm not really? collaborating with a class. And um, I'm not as daring as Laura in that I don't allow them to have lunch in the library. Um, but there are kids who, if they can, they'll be here um, every day during lunch to read something um, of their own choice, um, to play board games. I have um, chess and checkers and all sorts of different board games and coloring and crafts and origami and those kinds of things as well. So it's um, definitely also a social and emotional support space in the school. Um, as well as sometimes an academic space. So it's kind of um, both things at once and it's a flexible space depending on um, the time of day. Uh, interesting. I, I know New Bedford is about to get a senior lounge, which I think is a great thing, but 
for me, nerds like me, we would have been headed for the library rather than the senior lounge <laughs> at, at, at lunchtime. Um, you know, you've all been great. Uh, we have about five minutes to go. Um, and I'm sure that there are issues that uh, I haven't broached that, that each of you might like to uh, talk and emphasize. So I'll, let me let me go around and, and see if there's something that you'd like to put on the table and, and talk about that maybe we haven't covered. We'll start with Deborah. Um, I just, I, I, I just really love the last question that Laura and Madeline, um, discussed. And I once heard this phrase called the invisibly injured that actually Liam Lowney, who was the Massachusetts, um, department of, um, trauma's director. And he came to BP at Boston public schools and spoke. And it, it really hit home to me how librarians um, really develop trust and care for the kids. Not that the school teachers don't, but you know, the next year of students with a next a new set of teachers and so on. But the, the school librarian is a constant, and the library is a constant. And um, I wish there were more studies about the emotional impact the social emotional impact that libraries have because it's really significant. And over the course of my career in a variety of settings, people would say a public library or school library, if I, that library, if I had that, that library to go to, I would have been a different person. And, um, you know, I hand it to my school library colleagues for their hard work, particularly now in this day of AI and social networking, it's really, it's critical and significant, and I commend that librarians are really leaders in, in ensuring that students have access to just a quality education. Well, I love that term, invisibly injured. Great, great, great term. Laura? So I, I just want to speak to something that Andrew said when he brought up the very nerdy, unified Massachusetts accounting system. I think that that's really important. You know, this equity issue is a really big deal for me. You know, like I live in Fairhaven. I think it's, I, I want Fairhaven to have school librarians in every school. I want New Bedford to have school librarians. I want all of the schools in the state to have school librarians. I think all the kids deserve school librarians and school libraries and great books on the shelf and the safe space. So for me, more than anything, this, this is a really important equity issue. I have so much fun every day with my students and we do so many cool activities together. And I think all kids should be able to do that. I want that for all kids. So that's my bottom line. Andrew. Um, and I, I, well, thanks to the panel and to everyone. I think the most important thing I, I think that folks need when they talk about public schools is optimism. I think for too long, we've talked about what schools do not have. I think it's, um, I think we see it a lot in journalism as well, this kind of declinism mentality. I think um, schools are a place where society invests its best and sees its best. I think we have two great examples of that here in, in the library at Dartmouth and New Bedford High. And I think if we had more focus on that and what schools can do, what libraries can do, folks would be willing uh, to get behind those investments. And, and that's certainly the ethos we try to promulgate here in, in Bedford schools. And I think that kind of optimistic mindset will make a difference. Uh, an education process. June? So, yeah, just a, a couple of quick points. One, um, like building off what Andrew just said, I think, you know, is really important for me. And when I think about a meeting I just had where, you know, it was pointed out to us that the school department is um, is not revenue producing. But when but what it is, is it's an investment. It's an investment in the future. And when I think about the, the role that libraries play in that investment, I believe that it's important to note because we hear a lot about book banning. We didn't talk about that. What does that really mean? Um, but really what libraries do for our kids um, is it allows them to have access to information or to other, other people's stories that they may connect with. And so having 
students have access to things to, again, other stories, personal stories, perspectives. That's important in overall human development. And so I like to move away from talking about book banning and talk more about allowing students to have access to ideas and information that are important to them as individuals. We'll, we'll do book banning um, on a different different program sometime. <laughs> uh, Madeline, why don't you uh, bring us home and wrap it up? Um, yeah, thank you for having me um, on this panel. I agree with what Laura already mentioned about, um, I think every school should have a school library and librarian. Um, and um, it is an equity issue and we wouldn't be having this panel or this discussion about um, school librarians in a district like Newton or Wellesley as Superintendent O'Leary had mentioned. Um, and there is so much that a school library can provide for um, students' education. And part, I think, of why they um, have been rolled back is because of this focus on standardized testing and needing to um, drill down on core content. Um, but a library really can just be a place of creativity, of finding a joy of reading, and sometimes that um, gets left out of these conversations. Absolutely. Well, I, I want to thank each and every one of you. I know it's not easy to take time out of a school day to do these, but um, I thought this one was an important one to do, and um, I'm glad we had a nice, positive discussion. Go school libraries. Thank you, everyone. It was nice to meet you all and see you all. Likewise. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.